Okay, thank you, Colin. Um, it's always difficult to follow Maria. Um, she, by the way, has more commits on Bosch than anybody, including you or, or Dimitri. And you too? Oh. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so come come over here. Yeah. Like bring on all like now. Um so I hope not to disappoint Colin. Um but we're cer we're certainly going to talk about something different. Uh let me first say that you know, some of this is our experience um, you know, at IBM. Uh, I'll be honest, uh, some of it is pretty dumb. Uh, some of it is, is difficult, right? Things that we learn in, in, you know, as we operated in production. And when I say dumb, meaning like we were learning. Um, so um, hopefully um, some will resonate with you. Before we go any yes, Dr. Can Nick. Can you show me how you changed that version from one to two? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, uh, do it, do it. Here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we have 30 minutes, uh, lots to cover, and hopefully there are some questions. Um, so let me first introduce my colleague, uh, Zhu Uh That's my best Chinese. Our Mandarin. Uh, he goes by Matt, so he's not going to fall, I hope. Let's stay, stay away. Um, and he's part of the development team in China that we work with. Uh, obviously, the I and IBM, you know what it stands for, so that means that we have people all over the world. Uh, and the China team is, is huge, and he's part of the team. Uh, so he's going to help me with this, and uh, let's get started. We have one intro slide uh, that Maybe boring to you guys, and then we'll get into the meat of it. Okay, so the intro slide is what is Bluemix? You probably already know, but let me be clear about this. So, first thing is a certified Cloud Foundry, pass. Uh, it is uh, the largest installation of Cloud Foundry right now, uh, the public version, but we also have private and also a dedicated version. The dedicated is sort of you get a slice of the IaaS, which we use uh, called Software and then you get your own Bluemix for your enterprise. And then of course the private means that you get some installation inside uh, your own company. And various companies have similar things like Pivotal has their own offering similarly. Um, we announced that we have one million registered users. Uh, does it mean that those one million are actually developing right now on Bluemix? I don't know, maybe, I hope. <laughs> Uh, but we're certainly adding about 20,000 per month or more. Uh, that's the public data that we announced. There's over 100,000 of apps running right now. Hopefully they're not all Hello World. Uh, and one thing I know for sure is we have more than uh, 500 um, services in our catalog and easily beats anybody else. Uh, I'll challenge anybody, uh, you know, compared the services that we have. Uh, so we have a huge amount of services, uh, and some of it is pretty unique. How long does the CF marketplace man take to run? Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> we got to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> you can keep interrupting me, Dr. Nick, anytime. Um, it runs on software. Um, it's a challenge, I'll tell you. So a lot of the problem you'll see are challenging. Uh, it's, it's, it's really good to have, you know, the resource that we have in Bosch, people like Maria, and especially Dimitri, for instance, that helped me fix problem there that, you know, even inside IBM, very few people know. So uh, it's a challenge. It's also, also a very good um, alternative IaaS to AWS if you're considering it. There are some issues, but if, you, if, you, if you're looking at that, let me know. Uh, OpenStack certainly is also part of what we use right now. And then finally, as I mentioned, worldwide development team. And then we'll get into the meat of it. So the meat of it is we'll do a top 10 list. So sort of like, uh, you know, David Letterman when he was there. Okay? So we'll count down. So to help me, uh, 
Matt will announce each one of those and kind of like a synopsis and I get into the details. And he doesn't speak a lot of English, so he'll do it in Chinese. Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, number 10, change, uh, digital 改变. Some, someone know Chinese here? Oh, great, a lot. <laughs> so you can ah. check him, okay? <laughs> yeah, great. All right, so what we found is um, there's a need for a tightly controlled change request process. And the reason we do need that is because we have such a large team, right, all over the world. So when Dimitri releases a new stem cell, a new update, and we have to get it in there, or the press of Cloud Foundry, for instance, how do you get those fixes and the changes in? Well, change request process, we found, is, is important. Of course, it has the bads, so it's slow, um, you know, from the time we know that there's a change that we need to apply to actually executing it. Uh, that's a problem. Uh, sometimes it requires meetings very late at night because we gotta get everybody on the team. Uh, if you work with teams in China and all over the world, sometimes you gotta have either very early in the morning, especially for us uh, West Coasters, or late at night. So pretty much I have two shifts of work. Um, you know, 10 p.m., pretty much I talk to these guys because it's their midday. Um, the good thing is that it will limit propagation of some one of your changes, right? So if you have problematic changes, it will limit it. So the lessons learned is to essentially use some kind of a tool to alleviate, you know, the fact that you're going to have, um, you know, time zone differences for very large operations, and then making sure that you still coordinate uh, with a change request process. Most people will probably be doing this, but if you're not, you should probably consider that. Okay, uh, number nine, audit, uh, So what we found is um, there, you gotta have some level of audit for the health of the system. Because as you know, the system goes in steady state, you, you might wanna check. So the problem, of course, is that those audits can be very manual, right? And how do you automate some of those can be difficult. Um, the good thing is, uh, and if you guys don't know Tony uh, from Pivotal, you should talk to him. Uh, anybody here, he's here somewhere, I don't know. Tony? No, okay. He's here somewhere, I saw him. Um, you should talk to him, and the reason is because he'll teach you a lot about how to operate Bosch. And one of the things early on, about two years ago, when I started um, looking at you know, participating in Bosch, is to understand canary-based deployment. So if you don't understand that, you should talk to him. Uh, and that sort of gives you a set of audits, you know, early on in your deployment. But as the system goes into steady state, that's the kind of audits I'm talking about. So the lessons learned is to have potentially some tools like uh, what we did. It's called IBM Doctor. And I'm not trying to sell it to you. I don't think we have a, you know, that tool available for people to use. Uh, but we use it internally. And what it does is it allows us to have one entry point where we can see all of the different deployments. So there are hundreds of Bluemix deployments, and with this tool, you can kind of like oversee everything, sort of like an Uber, right? So you can see everything. Um, and it allows you also to, to, to look at the logs and then e even uh, apply some audit rules if you need to. So like checking to see if people did update their stem cell, uh, for instance, that's an example. Now, if you're doing single deployment, small deployment, the Bosch tool set is probably good enough for you. But if you're not, that's where you need something more. Uh, number eight, logging. Uh, so one of the things that I found out as I started working with the team, and, and I guess it's not new, maybe, uh, is the fact that you, know, you have to have access to logs. The problem, of course, is that with large deployments, you get log rotation, so you lose logs. So you could try to say, okay, well, let me increase the size of disk and stuff like that, right? It's not always easy when you're talking at scale of hundreds of deployments. So having a strategy that allows you, as you scale, that propagates those logs into one place and, and have access to them is important. Uh, the other thing is uh, keeping all this log is expensive and it takes time and, and planning. So you gotta, you gotta do it though. Uh, 
And separating certain logs is also very important. So one of the things we, we found out as we started doing a new CPI is being able to identify the CPI log versus the whole rest uh, can be problematic. So making sure that you have ways to, to do this early on is important before it starts going and then it becomes an issue. Uh, the good thing is there is log aggregator uh, that allows you to stream all the logs, but you still don't have a way to save it. So you can just access the log and you'll have to save it. So important for you, I guess, lessons learned is to introduce some kind of a tooling early uh, to deal with the fact that you're going to have a lot of log. Uh, certainly, uh, we don't work, I mean, we don't have any, ex I, I don't even have a Splunk account, but I've used it uh, when I was working at Pivotal with them, and it's actually a pretty good tool. At IBM, we have our own GOOM solution as well, uh, which is pretty good too, but I don't know, again, if it's being sold, so you can talk. There are other tools too, yes, definitely. Thank you, Dr. Nick. But it's important to start thinking about that because, um, when the house starts burning, um, you know, it's not the time to start introducing tools like that. So make sure you have it. Number seven. Uh, number seven, complain, digital uh, All right. Uh, so I, I searched uh, Wooz and then Drake came up. I actually like Drake a lot, but he does complain a bit. So maybe that's what it is. <laughs> um, so I worked on Bosch in it. I actually, some of the first commit in Bosch in it I was part of. But um, there are some problems, and I think a lot of it is being addressed. But the bads, and I think Matt uh, would make, may be able to explain this if you have a question, but there are issues like if you're trying to recreate a director you know, using Bosch in it, like an existing director, right? Uh, certainly there's been a lot of frequent updates as the tool uh, got released and sort of grew, uh, and that caused problem for us. Uh, the good thing is it's certainly a single binary, a Go binary, and it's in general, pretty easy to use. Uh, and it also introduced external CPIs. So if you know the history of Bosch, as Bosch init got introduced, that was part of also the change to external CPIs. So the good thing here is that, you know, because the tool is an active de development, I spent a lot of time with the team. Uh, it doesn't seem like you, you've spent one week at Pivotal working with Dimitri and the rest. You kind of see things are moving slow. It actually moves extremely fast. Within a month, they add features. So sometimes I go, like I visited China six times last year, and I would go back and come back, and it's as if I never talk uh, to DK at all because there are so many new features. And it's sort of the process that goes on right now. So you have to be sort of plan for the fact that things are moving very, very quickly. So like Bosch 2.0, for instance, right? And pretty soon Bosch 2.1 and 2.2, right? So <laughs> plan for that. Number six, uh, customer release, uh, So this fits quite well with what Maria was talking about, right? So she showed you essentially how to build a release and so on. It can be difficult, so don't, you know, she has a lot of expertise, so it looked easy, but it can be a bit difficult. I'm not trying to say that you shouldn't do your own release. Actually, I'm telling you, you should do your own release. And this is something that I used, um, my experience in Bosch and uh, certainly advice from Dimitri to essentially migrate all our custom software to custom releases. So what ended up happening is uh, whether you like it or not, big companies such as IBM will have custom software. And good luck trying to convince, uh, you know, Josh Mo somewhere that's building this custom software that he shouldn't be doing it because that's their livelihood, right? They're part of the corporation, they've been using it, they sell it to customers, so you can't convince them. So I don't think you should try to, I think you should just give them a path to add that custom software. The bad thing is to bake it into your stem cell. Really bad idea. So we did do that uh, for a long time. Yeah, yeah, I saw, I saw you move. Uh, <laughs> um, but we fixed that. But it was, a, it was a tedious process. It was very hard. So certainly using co-located releases was excellent feature for us and allowed us to sort of move out of this notion of creating our own stem cell with custom software. Um, so we ended up you know, creating our own releases. Uh, so basic lessons learned. You should trust the Bosch team 
and just use the stem cell that they do. Now, if you have your own IAS, like in our case, Starflare, we're gonna create, we create our own stem cell. So um, because of that, um, you know, we can kind of control the speed of it. But one thing that we work very hard, and again, uh, using the Bosch team's advice, is not to add anything else. So our stem cell is pretty much done for software on our pipeline, which is public, but it's essentially just adding one file that's different because we configure the agents differently than everybody else. That's it. We have absolutely no additional bits that are different. Everything else gets added. Uh, that caused, uh, that, that significantly solved things for us, but it was a long process to move to that. So if you're in that same boat, make sure that you do not add anything else. Uh, trust the Russian, he'll give you good software. <laughs> okay, number five, uh, no power DNS. Uh, uh, power DNS. Sorry, I can't translate power DNS. <laughs> so this is, this is number five. It's actually not for power DNS, it's against it. So here's the thing. Um, when you are running Bosch at scale, you can't really have IPs for every single node. I mean, like fixed IPs, right? Uh, maybe you could, but it will be expensive and it's also not a good strategy. So dynamic IP solution works and it's important for you to, to, to consider it. But of course, if you're starting to add dynamic IP, you get the problem of you need a DNS. Now, if the IaaS that you have provides DNS, that's great. Otherwise, you use something like PowerDNS, but that's a problem because it's a spoof, right? So a single point of failure, and it will go down. Uh, and when it goes down, your whole deployment is dead, pretty much, until you revive it or you fix it or something like that. So that's a big problem. Uh, and it's not very easy to make PowerDNS HA. So um, I think there were some teams in IBM that tried that, and if you look through the web, you might see people trying that. I think it's, I mean, you could try it if you, if you have some solution, I'd love to hear it, and I'm sure other people might as well. But definitely, um, you know, just get rid of it. Now, how do you get rid of it? Um, some IaaS, uh, like I think uh, AWS provides some level of DNS, that's HA. So if you, if you use those, then that's great. In our case, um, we don't have uh, a good power D, uh, DNS solution, that's HA. So what we've been doing, and I'm actually working right now with the Bosch team, with Tyler and the team, to add uh, a solution for PowerDNS, to get rid of PowerDNS. So essentially a solution for DNS. So if you're interested in this, we should chat. But basically that's, that's the lessons learned, I guess, is that think long and hard in general not to have any non-HA jobs or nodes, because as much as you think, well, you know, I'll protect it, I'll, you know, somehow, <laughs> you know, have somebody, so you can pay somebody to just like monitor this one, it will fail. And when it fails, you're gonna have to deal with the consequence. And in this case, certainly with PowerDNS, um, it will be a bad consequence. So. Uh, we can talk after, or maybe in the Q&A, I can tell you a little bit more details of the solution that we're working on. Okay, number four, uh, security update. Uh, so one of the things that you should all know, unlike a certain presidential candidate, is that the internet has a lot of evildoers. So do not trust anything, anything on the internet, pretty much. I mean, you should question everything. So what does that mean? That means that there are CVEs all the time. Right, pretty much every day, uh, like you know, security vulnerabilities all the time that you gotta fix. And the good news is, uh, well, the other bad news, I guess, is that you rolling those security updates can be very costly, especially when you have thousands of nodes. Right, it takes time uh, and and you know effort and things fail. Right, so um, how do you deal with security? Well, there's a good news here. The good news is the Bosch team, and I've seen them, I've been part of the team. If you come to Vivital, you'll see it. They now have a security czar. And essentially, every time there's a CV, you'll see tons of discussion. If you're in the private mailing list, you'll see some of those discussion very early. 
Uh, so any chip gets involved in that as well, so the foundation knows. And then all the different, uh, you know, people involved get, you know, know about those. And then the Bosch team essentially dedicates a pair or even, I don't know if they have more than a pair, you can talk to Tyler, he's the lead of the team, to, to essentially address the CV. And typically that results in a new stem cell. And what I'm seeing now, and I don't want to quote anybody, but I'm seeing about, about a weekly new stem cell, almost maybe not new stem cell, but new updates that you have to address. Now, if you're paranoid about security, then you're thinking, okay, well, I need to update very frequently. But if your update takes you a day or takes you a significant amount of time or effort, then it's a problem. So what do you do about that? So what we found is working with the IaaS um, can be a very good thing. So we, we do two things, uh, with some, one of which I kind of learned a little bit more detail yesterday talking to our uh, Bluemix manager, Fabio, uh, is that he uses a uh, IBM software called Tivoli Endpoint Management to essentially push patches to the different stem cells or the different nodes. Um, certainly, you could use Bosch also to update, uh, and that's certainly a way to also do it for a small. Well, we do that, um, but we, since we own the IaaS, that's part of how we're able to do this. Uh, I don't know if you can, I mean, certainly, you know, if you're running on top of Amazon, you can't really do that. Do One, well, so what I'm suggesting is the second piece is the reloading of OS. So this guy and a few other uh, at uh, IBM came up with a way, and we had to do it, to essentially uh, apply stem cells with, instead of recreating the machine, you save the machine and reload the operating system with a new operating system. And that allows you to essentially update all your nodes much faster. Uh, so of course it means that you have to change your CPI and it's a sp specific uh, um, you know, addition to the CPI. At first, this looked like a bad idea. Lots of discussion with uh, our Russian friend and other people. And now it looks like maybe it's a good idea. And there's other reason for it also, because if you had disk with a lot of data, you can actually keep that data. You don't have to reload it. So it has some advantages from that perspective. Uh, so there is a track actually right now on Dimitri's backlog to essentially allow this, uh, have that as a first class feature, to essentially allow reloading of the OS. And that helps us significantly. Now, we do it independently of that feature because we do it in the CPI, but hopefully it will be more of a broad feature, and hopefully it will help with that. But definitely helped us. Without that, we probably wouldn't be able to scale Bluemix. OK, uh, number three, um, multi-bosch deployment, decentral, uh, Dogo Bushu. So this is one that I'm sort of new to, and we haven't applied this, but I figured it's a lessons learned because we need it, essentially. So the issue is that you can start with one Bosch director, one deployment, and then go it, keep getting it bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, right? And that works, but obviously it leads to some level of bottleneck. And while it's easy, uh, it's gonna slow your growth. So one of the things that I found out, um, and uh, I'll credit DK again, is that you can do multiple deployment. And actually, even a single environment, you can divide it into smaller pieces. So in our case, for instance, we have thousands of uh, you know, nodes that are just running the apps, the DAs, or when you know, you're looking at Diego, the cell reps. So if you have thousands of those and you want to kind of divide them into smaller pieces, so that way you can try new updates on those uh, independently of the whole. And that helps you significantly because that way, when you're doing a Bosch update, you can kind of piecemeal update it. Now obviously, it's not gonna slow, it's not gonna require less time uh, than the overall uh, Bosch update that you would normally do, but you can be, it, it will be more manageable. Now I'm pretty much repeating what Dimitri and I and Fabio discussed yesterday. But um, that's certainly something that we are considering. Is so that, the, that made you give up links? Um, I'm not sure. We haven't applied this, so let's be fair about this. Um, I'm, 
mentioning it because I feel like it's something we should have done early on. Um, but from a computer science perspective, it's simple, right? It's divide and conquer. You know, don't let something go so big that you know it becomes difficult to manage. Break it into small pieces. And Bosch has that, and that's the important thing. Right. Right. It's definitely breaking down your deployment into multiple. So using what I call multi bosch deployment, but maybe there's a better term for it, like multi, like release deployment or, or multi manifest deployment. I don't know. But breaking down your release, your, your deployment into smaller chunks, because even if your IaaS is fast, right? Let's say Amazon, and you're doing one minute deployment, you know, like in terms of one node rolling, you probably can't do more than 10 or 20 at a time, right? You want to do a rolling deployment. And then you start multiplying that by the fact that things will fail, probably. So what do you do about that? And then the fact that you're trying and you have customers, so you don't want to, like, you don't want to, you know, break everything at once. So uh, you can see already that having smaller deployments where you can kind of like control it even if you've already tested it in a test environment, helps you because it essentially reduces the risk and makes it a little bit easier to manage when there are problems. Exactly, that's exactly right. So that's why it's an idea right now in terms of the fact that we haven't done this, we're in the process of looking at it. But I'm sure there are other people, maybe if you talk to Tony outside, uh, maybe Pivotal already is doing that. Uh, what? Uh, number two, 100% success. Uh, All right, so if I say 100% success, you should be worried. How is he able to do 100% success? So the point is that there is never 100% success. So the reason I say this is because talking to the team, especially the team from Rome and in the US and so on, it becomes a cultural thing. This is one probably one of the more fun ones is that it turns out that every single deploy, every single update never fully success. So it's never a case where you do a deploy and then, you know, as the system got large, that at the end it went through and, oh, success, 100%, never. There's always some failure somewhere. So what we essentially uh, realize is that it's okay. It's okay that it fails. Um, don't feel like because it's not 100% successful, you did the Bosch deploy and it went through all the way to the end and everything is good. Uh, it's not gonna happen when it gets big. So just deal with it, be happy. So, <laughs> and the other good thing is it's still usable. Most of the time, the deployment is actually quite usable. So even though there's a failure, a job fail, VM fail created, you can still continue, and then you can pick it up from where it, you left it. So the tool essentially has that built in. Uh, take advantage of it. Don't feel bad, don't panic. That's just a fact of life. It's sort of like the fact of life that you know, something in the cloud will fail, and you just have to deal with it. So design for failure, right? So the lessons learned is trust the tool in many ways, right? Things will fail, it never works, 100% all the time, at least on software. Now, I don't know about Amazon, maybe it's better, but my guess is no, because I've, I've used Amazon in the past and I know they fail too. So anyways, but maybe they're better, I don't know. Is this being recorded? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, uh, number one, uh, backup, uh, digital paper. All right, so I left this one last as number one. But it's one where most people would say, oh, obviously, dummy, you should back up. Well, you know, the reality is sometimes, you know, backups take such a long time that things fail in between those backups. And what do you do about that, <laughs> right? So this is a real case scenario that happened that involved me. So I'm planning my vacation. I think it was, uh, when was it? Last year? Yeah, last year around October and in the middle of the night, Chris Ferris calls me, uh, we need you, buddy. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going on vacation. Uh, yeah, but uh, I think it was YSZ was one of the environments completely failed. 
And then, of course, get on the phone before my flight. Uh, turns out the director of the database is dead. Okay, wow, cool. Uh, <laughs> so more calls, but I'm getting my flight, so I'm on my flight. Alex gets involved, he's here, my manager. Then, uh, okay, more calls, uh, and then they give me some synopsis of what it is, so I, we got some log trace. Uh, now, of course, I make sure I have my laptop, all the Bosch code, and then during my flight, I'm furiously looking to the Bosch code to figure out what happens, and then I see in the Bosch agent, there's a place where it formats the disks. <laughs> yeah. And pretty clear that's what's happening, and I can see kind of the logic, you know, maybe something went wrong. Okay, so get on the phone when I reach my midpoint, I think in Dallas, and, uh, you know, get on the phone with a bunch of people, tell them, okay, I see, I think I know what it is, feel kind of confident that I know what it is, and of course, what do you do? You call Dimitri. <laughs> it's Saturday, and believe it or not, he's amazing like this, he will pretty much help everybody. Um, so I got on the phone with him, and then we go through the code. Uh, and he agrees with me, but he's better because he identifies the reason why it got into this code. And then, of course, it turns out that there's some special condition where if the Bosch agent thinks your disk is, uh, is not properly set up, it will set it up. So it will just basically uh, format it and reconfigure it and so on. So that was the cause of the issue, and then we found out you know, going back, why that, that happened. But the reality doesn't change, right? Like you can identify the issue, but the, the, the patient is dead, right? What do you do? You gotta revive it. That wasn't your case though, <laughs> you're good. <laughs> so I've got, I've got only a few minutes, but I'll tell you the, the, the gist of the story. So I get to my vacation one week, and pretty much every day we have calls. And this is like, you know, calls with all level of the corporation, right? And then even a VP, you know, jumps in the calls every now and then to check, you know, what's going on. Anyway, so every day, you know, we're trying to work. So these guys, of course, you know, they're working overtime because they're working at odd hours, right? 12 hours from, well, is it 12 hours? Something like this from here. So it turns out uh, what ended up happening is we lost a disk where the director database is. We have zero backup and the deployment is live, customers are using it, but we don't have a Bosch director talking to it. So we can't do anything to that deployment. It's just alive, but anything happens to it, we can't use Bosch. So we have to figure out a way to recreate the director, right, and recreate the database. Yeah. So I told you all the bad things. There's a good thing in there. So good thing, and I'll tell you what we did, because it's a sort of lessons learned, but the good thing here is there is a backup. It existed even at the time when we did, uh, when this happened, but it wasn't very fast. So that prevented us from using it. Uh, so we've since, and I think the Bosch team in general since improved it. So now if you use Bosch backup, it will actually do a backup and it's much faster because I think it does, it, it avoids doing the blob store, which kind of slowed it down before. The other thing is, a lot of IaaS have snapshots of disk, so you should definitely consider that. And talking to Tony, for instance, I know that Pivotal does snapshots because they use a lot of AWS and that has really good snapshots. So you wanna consider using whatever the IaaS provides if there's a way to do backup. So that could be additional, info, additional backup that you have. But the lessons learned is, in addition to backup, which you should always do, including your phone and everything else that you have, right? All data that you have, you should back it up is uh, the notion of a dummy CPI. So the, guy in China, the guys in China and the team, we figured out the way we can reconstruct the database is to replay a deployment. And then instead of replaying a real deployment where we're creating VMs anew and we're creating disk anew, we're just repopulating a database. And that's what we did. So we reconstructed the director database that way. So I would highly recommend this at some point to be, I don't know, I have to talk to Dimitri and see if it's interesting enough for us to contribute that. And certainly it's not, it might be IaaS specific also, so it maybe doesn't make sense, but that's certainly a, 
uh, an idea, a, an approach that works for us. As I said, I put it as number one because it's the most catastrophic and it certainly impacted me directly the most. Uh, but hopefully it's, some, it's one that you never have to do because you should all be backing up, right? Like everybody, shake your heads. <laughs> all right, with that, I want to thank you and then we we'll, may have some time some questions. have time for questions. Okay, cool. here's, here's where we have to work as a team. We need sufficient questions to cover until I can find the next speaker. <laughs> what is your favorite color? <laughs> so, plenty of questions, please. Can we go back to Matt? I could finish in a chair. Ah, yeah, you could finish. Yeah. If you don't. Do, do you, we can do, Matt may finish with the lightning yeah. talks later on. That's our, our plan. Are you on Google's side? We're going to strike him with lightning. <laughs> <laughs> Bring him back to life. Um, Any questions? Ah. Well, yeah, you'd probably want to have one part of it that's deploying the CC and all the different pieces that are important. And then the things that you have to have multiple versions of, like things like the workers, essentially, and, you know, yeah. Because, like, in a, when we look at, you know, Bluemix and I say we have 1,000 nodes, I mean, 900-odd is just DA nodes or, or Diego nodes, right? The deployment, so not the release. Instead of one manifest, it's called the yeah. CA yeah. fraud. Right. That's, That's right. DA fraud. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's, I guess, the part of it also is, is strategizing for that, right? Because what ends up happening is you feel very confident with one big file with your entire deployment, and you keep doing it. And you kept going, and then it goes, it goes. Because it's easy, right? You just increase a number, and then you are happy. But that leads you into a state where, you know, like we, we are right now with some of our deployments where we definitely have to break it down because it's not, it's not manageable anymore. Is this driven by the luck for other reasons? Po by the what? The deployment luck. The management of deployment is doing something. Yeah. You can't do anything. That's right. Yeah, well, we should definitely raise that. Uh, where is Dimitri? Is he here somewhere? All right, I saw him outside, but we should definitely raise that because I think part of the issue is that you essentially, when you're doing an update, for instance, you can't do anything else. Now, it, you could stop it and then, you know, resume, but, you know, that's, that's the reality. And for, and I guess for IaaS that are super, super fast, uh, maybe that's not an issue, but for us it's an issue, definitely. Because it takes, like we did an update to London uh, deployment and it took more than 18 hours to go through it. Now, it's a large deployment. Like I said, I mean, we have the largest deployments, I think. So, yeah, Amit. I think part of it is to deal with what you know, I think what Dr. Nick mentioned, which is like you do canary deployments for single deployments to make sure that when you're applying something, there's a canary in the coal mine that will tell you something goes wrong. And I think when you have such large, you know, like so if each one of you are a node, uh, our deployment is much bigger than that. So imagine if I have to give a secret to each one of you, right? The challenge of making sure that you got the secret correctly. So if I divide you into smaller teams, then I can give that team the secret, and then I can potentially, in parallel, have Matt give the team the other team a secret, and we can kind of wall it out. So. It's not the network connection. Yeah, network connection is not the impact here. Just it takes time to take each one of them, put them down go through the process, recreating, reloading, applying stem cell, restarting jobs, everything. If you've ever done a Bosch deployment that is non-trivial, it takes time. I mean, it, you know, you could see, right, Maria was doing a 
relatively simple one. It took some time. Now, if you, apply, if you increase it right, by typical CF deployment and then a live production deployment, it just takes time. The good thing is the tool works, by the way. So Bosch will keep doing its stuff, and you, know, you just need to you know, kind of monitor it. Uh, of course we use CI. I mean, we, we even use uh, Concourse a lot. Um, I think the frequency of updates for us is a little bit slower than Pivotal. Uh, I, as a, because I, those are the two environments that I know. Uh, I mean, not that I know Pivotal's details, but since I spend a lot of time there, you know, public information I know. Um, I would say we try to deploy um, as frequently as we can based on, you know, making sure that uh, whatever got released, so I know CF gets released every week and then Bosch has some kind of a cycle. We don't, we're not in the bleeding edge, but there are other environments inside IBM that are in the bleeding edge. And then those are typically test environments and then those, depending on what happened there, then we migrate. Because as I mentioned to you, we have lots of different custom software, so we have additional releases that we have to test. So making sure that those work well and so on. Maybe one more? We have time. OK, one more question. Make it good. Yeah? So what percentage of services which you offer are you deploying? Do you force them to modify their software? That's a good question. I think at first, we made the mistake of not necessarily requiring. And that's a huge mistake, because now we are stuck with Lots of, release, lot, lots of services that are not Boschified, and we're going through the process of Boschifying them. Now, because we have so many, uh, 500, um, I think uh, it's fair to say that there's a, f there's a significant number that are already Boschified, and we're doing quite well, but some that are not, and we have to go through the process. So I would say um, we got work to do from that perspective. Uh, nothing that I can talk about. Um, I, I mean, I don't want to make this a sales pitch. I, like I, Dr. Nick was mentioning, there's tons of different tools. I mean, certainly if you're an IBM customer, then you should just ask about that. But um, generally, you're right, you know, that you start feeling it very quickly and then figuring out what the solution is, um, you know, can be difficult. It's, it would be better to use a solution that already people are using and are maintaining and works with CF and so on. Uh, but as far as I know, I, I'm not sure if it's, if it's a offering at this point. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much.